Good afternoon or good morning to everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. We still have a few people logging in, so we're just going to give them a minute or two to get settled and then we'll get underway. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thank you all for joining us today for today's webinar, Prairie Places, a Fort Ellis Story. My name is Christine Chilton and I'm the Community Relations Manager at the Nature Conservancy of Canada in Manitoba, and I have the honor of being your moderator today. I'd like to start by stating that we at the Nature Conservancy of Canada respectfully acknowledge that the work we do across the country is on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, both past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. The Fort Ellis Project, which we'll be discussing today, is on Treaty 2 territory. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, the Nature Conservancy of Canada is a national charity and Canada's leading not-for-profit private land conservation organization, working to protect our most important natural areas and the species they sustain. Since 1962, NCC and our partners have helped to protect 14 million hectares coast to coast to coast. 
Here in Manitoba, our first property acquisition was in 1977, and today we've conserved and protected over 71,000 hectares, which is almost 176,000 acres across nine natural areas, which are critical to the province's biodiversity. To learn more, I encourage you to visit our website at www.natureconservancy.ca. For today's event, we'll be joined by Dr. Golden Goldsboro, President of the Manitoba Historical Society, Rachel Whidden, Project Coordinator with the Association of Manitoba Community Pastures, Dr. Christian Artuzo, Biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service, and Rebecca Newfelt, Acting Science Manager for the Nature Conservancy of Canada's Manitoba region. I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us today to talk about the hidden gem that is the Fort Ellis Project. With more than 90% of Manitoba's prairie grasslands having already been lost, this is also a chance to learn more about a rare conservation opportunity for grasslands right here in Manitoba. Grasslands, like those on NCC's Fort Ellis project, have long been synonymous with Canada's prairie provinces. They buffer our waterways, sequester carbon, provide habitat for pollinators, and many rare and endangered species, and are the foundation of sustainable ranching economies in rural communities. It is my hope for you that at the end of our hour together, you'll have a better understanding of why Fort Ellis and the grasslands of Manitoba really are a national treasure. Before we begin the webinar, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping topics quickly. As we are being joined by people from across the country, you may experience a temporary glitch during the live stream. We thank you in advance for your patience. Today's webinar is being recorded. So we'll be sharing a link to the recording after the event. Just keep an eye open on your inboxes. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues, friends, and family. We want you to join in the conversation and share your thoughts with our online community. Feel free to connect with us through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram using the hashtag Fort Ellis during and after the webinar. We also invite your comments and questions. So you'll notice a Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speakers at any point, just type it in there. Uh, include who the question is intended for and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. So before we get to our fascinating speakers, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to the Fort Ellis Project through a short video. We were excited about the Fort Ellis property before we even saw it because we knew that it was an important trading post on the Carlton Trail, which after all was the main highway westward from Winnipeg during the 19th century. And so all of the Métis freighters and the Hudson Bay uh, employees and the early settlers took the Carlton Trail and uh, Fort Ellis was an important stop along the way. So that was exciting to us that uh, that history existed. And of course, because it's near the confluence of two major river systems, the Quipel and the Assiniboine, um, there was, it was a natural meeting place for many of our First Nations. And so that, that history precedes uh, the fur trade, but um, it's it's just a very interesting area from so many standpoints. Conservation is very important, we feel, for uh, a buffer and a way for nature to be resilient for the safekeeping of everything that really is important to humanity. We've exploited a lot of resources for our own benefit, which we are benefiting from, but we have to put back and we have to preserve for future generations. This property and other NCC properties on the Great Plains, they are really important sort of anchors of places where there can be solid ecological function. You know, the water is being taken care of and protected. 
there's good habitat for pollinators and that spills over onto the surrounding area around it. The soil is held in place because it's not being cultivated. So there's all of those ecological functions being served very well here on the Fort Ellis property and the Fort Ellis 3 addition to the group is just a, an important puzzle piece connecting it to the community pasture surrounding which is thousands of acres of land too that's being managed in ways that protect ecological functions. It's an example in Canada of how the geography from east to west interconnects on this part of the Great Plains where you get native grassland right beside the eastern hardwood forest. We've got bur oak and maples and birch and there's even some elm out here and lots of aspen poplar and then up there you've got this you know mixed grass prairie right beside it so you get this effect where you can be up there as a bird watcher i love this i was up there this morning i could see sprigs pivots and bared sparrows and, and chestnut colored long spurs and then walk down into the valley and boom there was a scarlet tanager right in front of me and there are not many places in canada where you can do this as a bird watcher and it just shows the kind of mix and diversity that there is in this landscape. This new Fort Ellis 3 parcel is a really important addition to the whole Fort Ellis project that NCC has going in Manitoba. And Fort Ellis is a terrific addition to nationally to NCC's uh, properties because of the, the loss of native grassland on the Great Plains. And this is Aspen Parkland. We've lost a lot of Aspen Parkland in Canada and the grassland around here surrounding this valley, the little remnants of grassland in with the Aspen bush are incredibly important and it's just so diverse because it's a diverse structure of, of plant life all around us. We've become enthralled with the beauty of the Fort Ellis property and the rich biodiversity and what that means in conservation because of the variety of ecosystems that occur on this property. I, I liked what the uh, Nature Conservancy stands for in terms of preserving areas that are endangered, um, especially as it relates to prairie en environments because the prairie is perhaps the most endangered ecosystem that we see in the country. So Fort Ellis, when we heard about it and saw it, was an immediate attraction to us. And it was important for us to make sure that when we were supporting an organization, that it was one that uh, our funds would be put to good use and properly managed. And we, we uh, feel that about Nature Conservancy Canada. And now that we have your attention, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Gordon Goldsboro, president of the Manitoba Historical Society. Dr. Goldsboro is a water quality specialist concerned with the impacts of humans on lakes and wetlands. Besides his scientific interests, Gordon is involved in the Manitoba heritage community, being the webmaster and president of the Manitoba Historical Society and an editor of the Prairie History Magazine. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Goldsboro. The floor is all yours. Well, I think we just had a bit of a technical glitch. Um, Gordon, I think you you're might be on mute. There we go. Sorry about that, folks. Right, so uh, I'd like to speak today about the historic Fort Ellis site. Interesting, both from the standpoint of the history that it represents and also the natural history that it represents. You know, the, the role of the Hudson's Bay Company in bringing people and trade goods into this region is an important part of the history of Western Canada. The company's first trading center was at York Factory, which is at the mouth of the Hayes River on Hudson Bay. In time, however, the HBC began to face growing competition <clears throat> from traders from Eastern Canada, from the United States, 
So it began to establish inland trading posts far from York Factory. And their first post in southwestern Manitoba was at Brandon House, alongside the Assiniboine River, several miles downstream of present day Brandon. And that was in 1793. Nearly 40 years later, in 1831, they founded another post on the Assiniboine named in honor of British politician and HBC shareholder, Sir Edward Ellis. Now, Fort Ellis became an important stopping place for those that were traveling across the vast inland prairie. You know, a westward trail from the Red River settlement that is today's Winnipeg to Fort Ellis was known actually by several names, uh, depending on one's ultimate destination. It might be known as the Fort Ellis Trail or the Saskatchewan Trail or the Fort Carleton Trail or even the Fort Edmonton Trail. Travelers would stop at Fort Ellis to rest themselves and their animals. They might find congenial social interaction, perhaps a little bit of reprovisioning for the journey ahead. And, you know, and so with good weather, no breakdowns and a bit of luck, a, a traveler leaving Winnipeg could expect to reach Fort Ellis in about a week. Now, between 1862 and 1864, Fort Ellis was moved about a mile east of its original site to a spot overlooking the Assiniboine River Valley. Uh, the new site had a commanding view of the meandering river below. And as we can see from this sketch from 1882, uh, the Fort Ellis Trail was not the only way to get there. We can see, for example, in the river, there is a steamboat. And in fact, steamboats could travel upstream from Winnipeg, a distance of some 300 kilometers, but the trip could take as many as 20 days. So like almost triple the, the time that it would take on the trail. Uh, and this was only possible in years when the river levels were sufficiently deep. Now, Reverend Andrew Baird visited Fort Ellis in 1881. He was on his way to Fort Edmonton. And 50 years later, he wrote a memoir that tells us quite a lot about what Fort Ellis looked like. He describes it as surrounded by a palisade of, of pointed wooden poles. And inside that fence were several timber buildings uh, that were constructed in what we call the Red River Frame architectural style. And the largest of these buildings was a two-story office and residence for the chief trader. If we look at this little map that uh, that Reverend Baird uh, uh, sketched for us, uh, we see that there are other buildings. There was a trading post building, of course, where the trading would occur, a warehouse for the trade goods, a storeroom, dairy, of course, a blacksmith shop. In those days, everything had to be done on site. Likewise, a carpenter shop and, of course, living quarters for the post workmen. Because be, uh, during its period of active use, there were anywhere from 10 to 30 men employed maintaining and operating Fort Ellis. Uh, however, uh, when Reverend Baird visited in 1881, the chief trader was a fellow from Scotland named Archie MacDonald. Uh, Mr. MacDonald's name lives on in the municipality of Ellis Archie, where the Fort Ellis site is situated today. Now, by 1890, when this photo was taken, uh, Fort Ellis was very much in decline. Uh, MacDonald had been transferred to Fort Quapel in what is now southeastern Saskatchewan. The newly arrived Canadian Pacific Railway had bypassed Fort Ellis and it established instead the towns of Bertle and Fox Warren that are located several miles to the east. The HBC closed Fort Ellis in 1888. Uh, a local trader bought it and sold the remaining buildings to settlers to be dismantled for materials to build other structures. By 1930, the only conspicuous remnant at Fort Ellis were two stone chimneys from Archie McDonald's former residence. Uh, we see that we see one of those chimneys here in this photo. When Reverend Baird visited Fort Ellis again in 1931, the year after this photo, the trip took him one full day. So considerably faster than by Red River cart, uh, considerably faster than a uh, steamboat, uh, but he took provincial roads that were graveled as far as Bertle, then dirt for the rest of the way to Fort Ellis. Baird, along with others, recognized the historical significance of the site. It was one of the last major fur trade posts on the Canadian prairies, and it had been a major stopping place for generations of indigenous people, explorers, surveyors, and eventually farmers as they headed west. 
local commemoration of Fort Ellis began on the 15th of July, 1930, which actually is the, was the 60th anniversary of Manitoba's entry into Confederation. The unveiling ceremony for the large stone cairn that we see here was attended by over 4,000 people. It must have just been crazy that day with that many people on the site. Today, the view of the Assiniboine River Valley from the site of Fort Ellis is mostly unchanged. You know, we can see in this photo the shallow river meandering its way back and forth as it heads downstream to Winnipeg. The most visible change, I think, are the abundant trees that now blanket the sides of the valley. You know, and I think what they speak to is the fire suppression and the lack of wood cutting that have occurred through the 20th century. Today, a trip to Fort Ellis from Winnipeg takes just three and a half hours, so considerably faster even than when Reverend Baird visited again in 1931. The only visible remains of the former fur trade post are two cemeteries a short distance from where the Palisade once stood. They contain an unknown number of graves, most of them unmarked, of Indigenous and HBC traders who, for a period over 130 years ago, made Fort Ellis one of the most important sites in what would become Western Manitoba. You know, so I am so pleased to be able to be here today to, uh, to congratulate the Nature Conservancy of Canada for its, its initiative and leadership in preserving the former site of Fort Ellis for its history, as well as its natural history, for the education and enjoyment of all Canadians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. As always, we really appreciate your insights on some of the fascinating aspects of the history of Manitoba, and in this case, uh, with a focus on Fort Ellis. Our next speaker today is Rachel Whitten. Rachel is a project coordinator with the Association of Manitoba Community Pastors. AMCP is a not-for-profit producer-led organization unparalleled in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Staff use established range management practices and principles to ensure strong forage supply and to deliver the environmental benefits of healthy pasture lands. Well-managed grazing lands deliver a number of benefits such as healthy forage production and resiliency during drought years, create conditions for species at risk habitats, biodiversity, healthy soils, and good water quality. The Fort Ellis project is nestled alongside and within the large grassland expanse encompassed by the Ellis Archie community pasture. The location of these lands represents a significant opportunity for NCC to work together with AMCP and local producers to partner on management activities. Whenever you're ready, Rachel. Thank you, Christine, uh, for your introduction. Uh, my name is Rachel Whitten and I work for the Association of Manitoba Community Pastures as the project coordinator. My presentation today will focus on the history and background of the Community Pasture Program, our management activities, and our work with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So AMCP is a fairly young organization. It was incorporated in 2014 and it was created in the wake of the federal decision to divest itself of the roughly 75 year old uh, community pasture program in 2012. The divestiture was staged over three years and completed in 2016. Uh, the mandate of AMCP is the sustainable management of productive and biodiverse rangelands enhanced by livestock production. So there are 19 AMCP community pastures throughout Manitoba from roughly the Swan River area down to the U.S. border, uh, totaling 360,000 acres of land. Uh, the creation of an umbrella organization uh, was led uh, by the Manitoba government and the Manitoba beef producers. There are also four associated RM managed community pastures uh, which are not represented on this map. So the Ellis Archie Community Pasture uh, is the first pasture established in Manitoba in 1940. And it was established at the same time as Ellis North, which is just the Manitoba side of the Spy Hill Ellis Community Pasture, just directly to the north 
there at the time. Uh, it's about 70,000 acres of land and it was the largest pasturage area in the province. It's primarily crown lands and marginal farms uh, that had failed during the Great Depression. And the Ellis Archie Community Pasture came under the management of AMCP in 2016 uh, following federal divestiture. And here's a picture of the yard site with a band of horses uh, that grazed at the pasture. So in terms of our grazing services, uh, it provides, the LSRT pasture itself provides services for local producers who bring about 2,000 adult head of livestock every grazing season. And there are dedicated staff on site who ensure overall uh, oversight of the land, as well as animal care, cattle rotations, and range management. So the Community Pasture Program has proven to be a successful model that serves both the local livestock industry and delivers wide environmental benefits. Uh, at 30, 38,000 acres, Ellis Archie is one of the largest remaining mixed grass prairie ecosystems remaining in the province. Livestock grazing serves to improve the diversity of the pasture by replicating natural processes and reduces brush encroachment. So just to further explain some of our uh, management activities that take place on the pasture, uh, these include large areas with moderate stocking rates in place. Uh, there is a managed grazing system, uh, which is referred to as twice over rotational grazing. Work is done by horseback, which maintains or it helps to maintain intact grassland and it reduces the need for linear development such as roads. We also do uh, range health assessments and ecological monitoring of the community pastures and staff are also highly committed. So I'll let uh, Christian and Rebecca speak to the uh, vegetation and wildlife of concern, uh, but just to note there are 12 uh, plant species of conservation concern and I've just noted the grassland bird species, which are federally and provisionally listed at risk. Uh, these include Sprague's Pipit, Barrett's Sparrow, short eared Owl, and Longspur. So in recognition of our range management practices and the environmental benefits of the Community Pasture Program, uh, AMCP was awarded the Manitoba Excellence in Sustainability Award. And over the last three years, NCC has supported AMCP on a number of joint priorities. Uh, <clears throat> these include brush controls, range health assessments and management planning, as well as infrastructure improvements. Uh, we do seek to work together on protecting species at risk habitat, uh, focusing on biodiversity. And I'm pleased uh, that there may be new or that there are new opportunities on the horizon to expand uh, the special area of mixed grass prairie, uh, restore diversity and available habitat for species at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rachel. Rachel. We're grateful to you for your time today and for sharing your knowledge of Manitoba's community pastures. Our third speaker today is Dr. Christian Artuzo, a biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Services. Christian is a conservationist and ornithologist with extensive experience in avian monitoring, monitoring sorry, and conservation. He currently works in the conservation unit of the Migratory Birds Division of the Canadian Wildlife Service. He also sits on the Bird Specialist Subcommittee of the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. As you'll see, Christian has spent countless hours working on both the Fort Ellis project and the adjoining community pastures, making a perfect person to speak with you here today. Take it away, Christian. Okay, thanks everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, okay. So thanks very much. I am going to share some photos today that were all taken by myself up in this beautiful area, uh, either on the Fort Ellis property itself or um, in the surrounding community pastures that Rachel just spoke to, um, Fort the Ellis Archie or the Spy Hill Ellis community pasture. 
And the first thing I want to do before I show you some pictures is actually borrow from a Google Earth image a little bit. Oh, just and Christian, just temporarily. I don't think your screen is showing. Ah, uh, that's interesting. Okay. Okay. I apologize. Let me let me try this again. Okay. How about now? Not yet. How about now? <laughs> I see a black screen. It should be coming. I there think. we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. So my apologies. I'm going to race forward. And this is the Google Earth image that I just mentioned. Uh, and the, uh, the, the thing that I want you to notice on this in the red oval near the top left is the large expanse of grassland that you can see from space. The, the two sort of soft peachy green areas there are the mixed grass prairie that was spoken about in Trevor's video and, and in Rachel's talk. And the large size of that prairie up there is extremely important. It is probably one of the only large expanses of mixed grass prairie that we have left in Manitoba. You can contrast that with uh, the southwest corner of Manitoba, and if you know your geography, you may recognize Oak Plum Lake near the top and Whitewater Lake near the right edge of this Google Earth image. And if you're like me, the first thing you'll notice is just how pixelated this Google Earth image looks. And that's, of course, because everything is divided up into roads and sections and quarter sections. So the, the, the prairie down here, although most birders visit here to see their prairie grassland birds, does not have this big expanse of prairie that you see up in Fort Ellis and the surrounding community pastures. And that's extremely important. Now, it's actually the loss of grassland that is the primary driver for the population losses we see in grassland species. Grassland birds are famous for, unfortunately, the bad news story. And most of the species that you see on this map are used to occur in Manitoba as far east as Winnipeg, basically throughout the prairie ecosystem, the Great Plains ecosystem. But as you can see from these maps from the Breeding Bird Atlas, because the habitat is so fragmented, they now really only occur in the southwest. And all of these, of course, are now listed in Canada under the Species at Risk Act and now federally. But Fort Ellis property and the community pastures are a home for many of them. And I'd like to sort of walk you through why this particular little piece of geography is one of my absolute favorite places in all of Manitoba. I would argue that this is um, probably the only place in Manitoba where you can really get a sense of what prairie is and what it's what it's like or what it used to be like uh, a long time ago. So as Gord mentioned and as is mentioned in the video, uh, you can start at the bottom of any of the river valleys, the Capel or the Assiniboine or on some of the smaller creeks like Beaver Creek and you will find tall deciduous forest or gallery forest right near the creeks and rivers. Um, it doesn't extend too far up the slope, it, although as Gord mentioned, it's increasing. If you were to be a dawn in any of the river bottoms, you would find a bunch of forest birds like this oven bird shown here, like the scarlet tanager that Trevor mentioned in the video. If you're there at dawn, the chorus, the dawn chorus is quite spectacular. It's absolutely full of forest birds. And then if you, from the river bottom, if you sort of climb slowly up towards the slope, uh, you will start to notice the trees get shorter and it becomes much more shrubby. And near the crest, and this is basically the crest that you're looking at here, there's actually in that shrubby community a whole different suite of birds Things like this chestnut sided warbler and uh, the towhees. Actually, this is interesting to birders in Manitoba because you can find both eastern towhee and spotted towhee here at this convergence. 
kind of an east meets west, as Trevor mentioned in the video. And then once you crest the top of the valley, it just opens up into a vast sea of grass as far as the eye can see, or maybe you may see some trees on the valley on the opposite side, but it is a massive exp expanse of grassland. And for me, this is the way to experience prairie and to get out there in the middle of it and have nothing but grass and you will be surrounded by many of Canada's most endangered species, things like the chestnut cod longspur here, which is now listed as, which is recently uplisted to endangered, which has lost 90% of its population in Canada, which Ernest Thompson Seton described as one of the most abundant birds in Manitoba a century ago. But now this is the place to come. If you want to be standing in a prairie and have these beautiful little birds dancing around you, this is definitely one of the best places to come to see them. And so I was fortunate, uh, as Christine mentioned, to take part in a series of bird surveys up on the Fort Ellis property itself and some of the new acquisitions and actually also on the community pastures. And uh, lumping those uh, two community pastures and the Fort Ellis property together, since 2015, we've recorded a little over 150 nesting bird species on this property. Now, 150 birds may not sound like a lot, but in terms of nesting species on that area, that's extremely significant. That's a very high number. And of course, the number would grow if you added passage migrants and wintering species. That, but uh, in terms of nesting birds, the diversity here, because of that convergence that Trevor spoke to, because of the mix of habitats, is just staggering. And that includes 14 species at risk, including, of course, the grassland species at risk, which are the most endangered, but also some of the others in the woodlands. And we've been super interested to find recently things like Eastern Whippoorwill and Canada Warbler here as well, which you can find in Riding Mountain to the east, but seem strangely out of place this far west. And in terms of contributing to the Conservation Data Center, we have added over a thousand data points just in those three years. So it is just dripping with species at risk, up, especially on the grasslands, which are of primary conservation concern. And there's a bunch of other amazing, beautiful birds up here, like the mountain bluebird, which is difficult to find elsewhere in Manitoba. And Baird Sparrow, another, well, provincially endangered, federally special concern, just a whole bunch of amazing species up here to watch. Uh, and But it's not just the presence of these species, actually, it's the density of these species and the way that they are thriving on this property. And to illustrate that, I hope you'll forgive me one small table here. Uh, this is a photo of a Sprague's pipit that you're looking at, but the numbers up the top compare the surveys that we did for the Species at Risk Partnership on Agricultural Lands in the southwest Manitoba, mixed grass prairie important bird area with the two community pastures. If you're in the southwest and when we're surveying those grasslands, we do what's called point counts. We stand and listen for five minutes and every 10 point counts, we will detect one pipit or every three or four point counts, we will detect the chestnut colored lung spur. So it's averages out to 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 birds per point count respectively. But if you look at the community pastures, it's actually more than 10 times that density. And basically, if you're at Fort Ellis or Ellis Archie, you're getting a Sprague's pipette on every single point count on average, which is pretty staggering. And that really is a product of the expanse of grasslands up here. These birds do so well when they are in that sea of grass. That's what they evolved with. That's how they avoid predators. That's how they avoid parasites. That's how they are successful hiding in the grass and getting good fecundity. Uh, but you put them in a fragmented landscape and they don't do nearly as well. So these densities are a real tribute to excellent management of these areas. And that photo of a Sprague's pipit is on Ellis Archie. You'd, you'd be hard pressed to, to photograph this bird just about anywhere, but Ellis Archie is the place if you want to try. And for all those reasons, uh, we did, we uh, were able to put a proposal together to declare this an important bird and biodiversity area, which was accepted and announced at the Lost Prairie Conference in Winnipeg in 2019. So it's now an IBA, an important bird and biodiversity area. 
And I've spoken about the birds, which are what I know, uh, but there's a whole lot more going on in terms of biodiversity. So I'm going to leave that to Rebecca to, to talk to you about and say thank you very much. Thanks, Christian, for sharing your expertise on grassland birds and uh, putting a hopeful spin on species at risk and the importance of grasslands, such as those located on the Fort Ellis project for the continued existence of these species. Last but certainly not least, Rebecca Newfeld is the Acting Science Manager for the Nature Conservancy of Canada's Manitoba region. Rebecca leads and coordinates the landscape scale planning and monitoring activities of NCC Manitoba's 10 natural area conservation plans and manages the region's natural area based science and research initiatives. She coordinates the use and continued integration of the open standards for the practice of conservation in Manitoba's adaptive management and planning frameworks, including the management of the Fort Ellis project. The floor is yours, Rebecca. Thank you, Christine. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada's uh, beautiful Fort Ellis project and an exciting uh, opportunity to conserve a new piece of this uh, landscape. So native grasslands are um, one of the most endangered ecosystems uh, in the world, and many of the species that depend on them are declining or are considered at risk. Uh, the grasslands of the Fort Ellis project uh, and the surrounding community pastures uh, represent one of the few remaining large and continuous blocks of mixed grass prairie in Manitoba. Um, so the direct loss or conversion of habitat to other types of land use uh, or development is only one of the threats facing prairies today. Um, ongoing threats to these ecosystems include things such as species loss and structural changes from the introduction and spread of invasive species, uh, changes to disturbance regimes such as fire and grazing that result in the encroachment of forests and changes in the ecological function um, of these habitats, as well as fragmentation and loss of um, connectivity that uh, populations and ecosystems need to thrive. Um, Many indirect impacts and external pressures, such as the physical disturbances, noise and light pollution uh, from adjacent activities are also amplified in Manitoba's increasingly fragmented prairies. So as Krish kind of demonstrated, as it becomes more patchwork, um, the effects of, of what's going on becomes more and more impactful on our habitats, really emphasizing the importance of those really large uh, landscapes. So the Fort Ellis project, as mentioned previously, is nestled um, kind of within the large grassland expanse encompassed by the Ellis Archie community pasture. These grasslands evolved under a disturbance regime that include grazing and fires that occurred at a landscape scale and maintaining these processes at, at that large scale are, are critical to the viability of these prairie ecosystems. So the viability and sustainability um, of the habitats and species populations uh, on Fort Ellis are actually enhanced and strengthened because of the presence and the management of those community pastures um, that surround it. So the location of these lands, as mentioned earlier, is a significant opportunity for NCC to work with partners such as uh, AMCP and local producers. And by working together, we're not only more efficient at achieving our shared goals, but we're able um, to better able to implement the stewardship activities at a scale that's large enough to provide uh, the necessary, necessary heterogeneity and connectivity uh, of these prairie habitats that I mentioned is so key to, to them being resilient um, and strong. And um, these partnerships and the scale that we were able to work at is really key to the sustainability um, of, uh, of the livestock industry that also relies on the health and the presence of these prairie ecosystems. So, as you saw in the previous slide, the Fort Ellis three portion of this project, which was that little yellow um, uh, parcel, uh, represents a bit of a donut hole within that large landscape we've been talking about, um, as well as the valley complexes that kind of surround the area. Um, so this large landscape kind of comprises not only Fort Ellis and adjacent pasture lands, and this new project, Fort Ellis is right smack dab in the middle of them. So conserving the sand hills, woodlands, wetlands, prairies, and riparian areas of this project um, will maintain and build on this amazing diversity of habitat and species and the species found in this area. And this project uh, also provides an opportunity to actually restore about 300 acres 
of uh, previously converted land right in the heart of this grassland back to prairie. So some portion of this, this new project had actually been, um, the, the prairie had actually been converted and used for annual cultivation. So this is a huge opportunity for us to, to put that back into prairie and reconnect those grasslands together. This will help reduce the fragmentation impacts I mentioned earlier and create additional habitat for those numerous uh, risk and rare species that use these habitats. So to date, over 50 species that are considered either species at risk, rare or uncommon, um, have been documented across Nature Conservancy of Canada's Fort Ellis project. The majority of these species are associated uh, with those threatened community, prairie communities that dominate this landscape, as, uh, as you saw. However, the prairies are actually only a fraction of the incredible and really important biodiversity that's found uh, in this area and on this project. And it's actually this mosaic of ecosystems that are found on Fort Ellis and the surrounding lands that makes it so amazingly diverse and spectacularly beautiful, as you've heard from others. So um, as those big uh, wide expanses, that sea of grass, Krisha mentioned, approaches the Cinnamon River Valley, um, those plains uh, kind of grade into this matrix of, of prairie patches and savannas, wetlands, and, and aspen oak bluffs. The deep valleys of the Cinnamon River and Beaver Creek are aligned with numerous freshwater springs which run all year round. And they replenish Beaver Creek and the Assiniboine River and they create expansive marshes in the valley bottom, peatlands and calcareous fens and they host rare species that are found in no other habitat type such as the round leaf monkey flower. Forests of aspen, ash and birch line the north and east facing slopes while the rolling sandhills, oak woodlands and gravelly prairie flourish along the sunnier slopes that face to the south and the west. So this amazing and expansive matrix of habitats supports a wonderful diversity of species. So there's an abundance of large mammals. Um, this includes mule deer, elk, moose. They roam across the property and the pastures along with black bears, wolves and Canadian lynx. The rivers and creeks uh, are home to snapping turtles and river otters. Uh, the oak savannas and the sandhill woodlands provide breeding grounds for at-risk species like the common nighthawk and uncommon snakes like the smooth green snake and the red belly snake. Uh, the windblown open sand complexes are home to rare tiger beetles and plants that are specially adapted to this extreme habitat and you, you won't find in, in other prairie or grassland types. And of course, that expansive mixed rest prairies, they support at-risk pollinators such as the monarch butterfly and the yellow banded bumblebee, in addition to those amazing diversity of grassland birds that Christian was mentioning. So those species and habitats I touched on are, are just a small fraction of the diversity of this area. Um, and conserving these lands and water not only protect these, this critical habitat, but these forests, grasslands and wetlands provide and filter our drinking water uh, and they provide food and sustenance in and of themselves. They support pollinator communities that are critical for food production. They help sequester our carbon and uh, provide really important lands for, to support local economies you know, through livestock production. Um, and this is just, again, a small taste of, of what this amazing area is, you know, provide to us um, as humans, as well as just their amazing intrinsic value. So I really hope you will consider joining us uh, in conserving and stewarding this amazing place. Um, so protecting these landscapes and our natural heritage is, is more than just setting aside these lands, but it also means caring for them. Um, and this may mean restoring or removing barriers to the natural ecological processes that make them resilient. As I mentioned before, those landscape scale processes um, need to occur to keep these lands healthy and functional. So this could include fire and grazing, um, might include managing the land to abate threats and improve the health of the ecosystems. And of course, reconnecting people with these places that we're all actually a part of. Um, so Nature Conservancy Canada works to achieve this through partnerships with many others, including other conservation organizations, the partners who are on this call with us today, local communities and local landowners and producers, as well as government and industry partners. So it's very much a, protecting these areas and landscapes at the scale that really needs to be done to be effective really requires this, these amazing collaborations. So thank you so much for uh, joining us and learning about this special project, which is uh, very dear to me and uh, definitely, as Krisha said, one of my most favorite places uh, in Manitoba. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rebecca. Your ability to tie everything together is always appreciated, and today is certainly no exception. So we have several questions for the speakers that have been submitted by the audience. As a reminder, if you have a question you have not yet submitted, please enter it using the Q&A chat box feature. Let us know who the question is for and we'll get through as many as time allows. So uh, here is our first question. Uh, hi, thanks to all the speakers for this great talk. I'm curious if and how community members are able to assist with the great work happening at Fort Ellis. Rebecca, would you like to take that one? Yeah, sure. So um, NCC is a, a few different uh, programming and opportunities that uh, uh, we've done and uh, hope to continue doing in the future uh, to get people involved in, in helping us work on these properties. So. Um, there are opportunities for, for volunteers to actually come out um, at, at organized events to, to help us do actual on the ground uh, management. So things like weed control, removing woody encroachment. Um, we've had uh, cleanup a cleanup events where our volunteers help us remove old debris. Um, so there's definitely opportunities um, and we hope more in the future as uh, um, we'll have more opportunities for people to come out. We also have uh, programmings with uh, local education um, groups, uh, schools uh, to to get students out to help us do different types of monitoring programming. So we actually have a long term program with uh, mammals, having students work with us on child cameras, as well as um, other activities to to get school groups and youth out on the property to help us with our work. Great, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Christian, what has caused the loss of grassland birds, and what can we do to help? So it's a great question and it's a complicated answer, but the simple answer is that habitat loss is generally considered to be the major driver of those real population declines. So that those birds just cannot survive in a cropland and or even like a moderate, like a modified hayland. In many cases, they need the structure of the prairie. Um, and we, um, you know, the, you can see various stats on the different prairie ecosystems. You'll, if you know, for tall grass prairie, we often say it's lost greater than 99%, and for mixed grass prairie, we often say it's lost more than 90%. But the interesting thing about prairie is that prairie has evolved with disturbance regimes like grazing and fire, and um, actually, Gord spoke to fire and the effects of fire suppression. And wet cycles and drought cycles are actually very important and our native prairie grasses are very resilient to drought, but they do need to be grazed. And of course, once upon a time that was bison doing much of the grazing. Uh, today we kind of rely more on cattle, although there are certainly bison operations in southwest Manitoba as well. So it's a little bit ironic, but what we can do to help actually is to some support grazing operations like the community pastures. Those type of operations are providing an, incredi an incredibly important ecosystem service. And the public is not necessarily always aware of the importance of that service, but I would always add that that needs to be done in the right context, in the right, right place. So what you can do to help is support you, beef production on native prairie and the economic mechanisms to keep that active because actually there's often this comes down to market. You can support local producers who are who are ranching sustainably in that aspect. You can also of course support things like this particular project which is a restoration project uh, trying to re to build together a bigger piece of prairie by uh, as Rebecca said, stitching together the donut hole that's been carved out. So the more we can do for the big areas of prairie, the better. So this is a really perfect one. Thanks, Christian. Uh, another question here. Uh, how can we visit this exciting place, Rebecca? Yeah, so um, Many of uh, NCC's lands uh, are open to, to visitors. Um, in cases where we have uh, active land management, um, we do often ask people to, to contact us ahead of time. So um, in this case, uh, at this time, 
uh, we do ask people just uh, give us a call. Let us know you're interested in coming out to the property. Um, it's pretty easy to kind of find locations if, if you're not sure, or we can help with that. Um, and uh, we're, it's, it's open to, to yeah, pedestrian walking and, and hiking. Um, there is hope in the future we'll have a bit more um, ability to a bit more seamless uh, access to the project. So something that's coming soon, and there might be more information on that in, in the coming um, you know, months. Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, just just get in touch with us and let us know you're interested in going, and uh, we'll get you set up to to with some directions and um, let you know where you can go and make sure everything's uh, safe to do so. As I said, we do have active land land management, so we can at least let you know what's going on out there. Thanks, Rebecca. I believe too, if people visit the website uh, fortellis.ca for those uh, who wish to tour from the security and uh, comforts of their own home. Um, there is a Google Trekker hike also available online. Um, Gordon, where can we go to learn more about the history of Manitoba and the Fort Ellis project? Well, I may seem a little biased when I say this, but I think the best place to find out information is from the website of the Manitoba Historical Society. If you go to our page, mhs.ca, and in the search box, type Fort Ellis. Um, I just tried it now, and I came back with dozens of, of uh, pages of information about Fort Ellis, and not just the fort itself. I, I spoke earlier about the trails that you would take to get to Fort Ellis, and there are remnants of that trail periodically around the, across the prairie where you can still see, among other things, the ruts left by the ox carts. Um, and on the landscape, they're still visible. And we not only just provide information about these sites, uh, and we not only provide photos of these sites, we also provide the geographic coordinates so that if you really wanted to go and see them for yourself, uh, your GPS could navigate you right to them. So uh, there are other places as well, but I would say the website of the Manitoba Historical Society is a great place to get more information. Perfect, thanks Gordon. Are there any signs on there of the effects of climate change? Rebecca, Christian, uh, Rachel, who would like to take that one on? It's a fantastic question. I will say that, that uh, it's hard. It's hard. You know, the scientist in me will always say it's hard to demonstrate climate change in a specific site like that. Um, but certainly. We do see uh, tree in, and shrub encroachment, in particular up in the northern portion of Spy Hill up there. And there are, um, as Gord mentioned, more trees as well. It's possible that some of the tree growth uh, is related to the precipitation regime, and it's probable that the precipitation regime is impacted by climate change. But to say, it's causal or to demonstrate causality is pretty tricky, but certainly the the one of the real active management challenges with prairie anywhere is that you need you need to keep it prairie. You need to worry about the trees and the shrubs encroaching sometimes. So and that takes active management and probably with climate change that will become or that could become an increasingly difficult challenge. Excellent. Thanks, Christian. Uh, what are the most challenging invasive species within the Ellis Archie pasture and what is being done to manage them? Uh, Rachel, would you like to address that one? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, there is some common tansy within the pasture. Uh, unfortunately, it's near uh, a wetland, uh, so it would be inappropriate uh, for chemical application, but it's being monitored uh, continually and we, we maintain ground cover and that helps to prevent spread. Uh, there was some leafy spurge found two years ago and fortunately it was just in early uh, growth or his first year growth. Uh, so there was a chemical use just on that specific site. Uh, just to get rid of the leafy spurge and so far it hasn't come back. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, and time for a final question. Uh, are there any walking trails through the area? Rebecca? Yeah, so um, there's of course uh, various trails that um, 
um, occurred on the property um, from from the past and, and are currently still kind of in use for for access to different areas. Um, and um, as I said before, um, they are uh, we do invite people to come and, and walk and, and visit the property. Um, so so yes, the spots to go for walking. Um, I mentioned before we are kind of working on hopefully expanding some opportunities there for people to come and visit and explore. So more to come hopefully um, in the future. But yeah, so as I mentioned before, just uh, contact us by phone, by email um, if you're interested in hiking. And uh, there's most definitely spots there for you to, to go explore. Great. So that's all the time we have for questions today. If you didn't we didn't get to your question or if you have something else you'd like to ask any of our panelists please just reach out to us at events at natureconservancy.ca and we'll gladly pass them along to you, to you as we wrap up with today's speakers i hope you've enjoyed your time with us and will consider joining us in conserving and stewarding the amazing place that is the final parcel of our fort ellis project the fort ellis 3 is a rare conservation opportunity this 261 hectare, which is 644 acres, uh, parcel of land is key needed to complete one of the last large intact expanses of native prairie grassland in Manitoba. It'll conserve species rich land where mammals like elk, moose and the Canadian lynx roam and where threatened birds like those Christian spoke to depend on the unique habitat for survival. You can help support the conservation of the Fort Ellis project and surrounding lands by visiting NCC website and donating to the Fort Ellis campaign at www.fortellis.ca. Thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Gordon, Rachel, Christian and Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing your insights and expertise. If you have any additional questions or comments regarding today's webinar or would like to connect with NCC, again, you can reach out to us directly by emailing events at natureconservancy.ca. We encourage you to stay tuned for the link to today's webinar recording, which you'll receive in our follow-up email within the next 24 hours. On behalf of the Nature Conservancy of Canada, thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. We hope to see you next time.